I am Dean Matthew Woodward. I'm the Dean of Trinity Cathedral, where we are today. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. Wonderful to have those who are watching us on live stream. Um, I am so glad to be standing amongst this group of clergy and volunteers from faith communities around Sacramento, who we have been working in partnership with for years on projects. So we were able to come together um, and be able to respond to this situation um, as a group. And that's really wonderful. A number of them are going to come and speak to you in just a moment. I wanted to start by reflecting on uh, some things that I've been thinking in the last couple of days. When a group of migrants, we know them to be asylum seekers, was dropped off outside of one of our partner churches' buildings, it's a little kind of crazy. What do you do? And in moments like that, I really want to go back to a book and like, figure out exactly what the next steps are. And fortunately, our faith traditions have books that guide us. And so I'm thinking particularly of Micah 6, 8, which says that we should do justice, seek mercy, and walk humbly with our God, which is a great place to start. And I also think of the words of Jesus when he was speaking to his friends, and he said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And his friends were confused. And they said, when were you naked and we clothed you? When, when were you uh, thirsty and we gave you a drink? When were you hungry and we fed you? And he said, whenever you did it to any one of these, you did it to me. We really do want to talk about these migrants and what we've been doing to provide hospitality for them today. We're aware there are other dimensions for this story, um, political and legal, but we're not touching on those. The volunteers here have been working with these asylum seekers to receive them while in welcome. And so I'd like to invite the executive director of Sacramento Act, the organization that brings all of us together, Gabby Trejo, if she would come and speak to us now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gabi Trejo. I am the Executive Director for Sacramento Act. And um, we are members of Pico, California and Faith in Action National. Um, at Act, we are guided by some principles that are really important to us based on faith, justice, hope, and inclusion. And since the arrival of our new neighbors, really, um, it has been uh, our Act leaders, staff, clergy, and the community uh, at large, they have helped us both welcome and protect them. Um, and for that, I feel very thankful. Um, you know, it has been a true team effort, really. Um, just, this has, could not have been done without just when Sacramento Act. You know, you see a lot of partners are missing from this page. Um, and I can't thank them all, but ranging from nonprofits to attorneys to the local government, state government, the faith community. On behalf of our new neighbors, I want to say thank you for your generosity. I want to thank you for um, being patient with the fact that um, our new neighbors don't feel comfortable standing on this stage and respecting that. Thank you. I briefly want to share about our 36 new neighbors. They're mostly young people who are the first people in their families to come to the U.S. They have survived and endured trauma of being vulnerable in multiple countries. Some of them have walked anywhere between seven to three months just to get to the border in search of their American dream, the land of the as we talk about it in the faith community. But it is also true that that dream quickly became a nightmare. They were lied to and deceived. They have, of course, um, pending cases, so we are unable to go into details about those legal cases. But their, stor their stories of courage, even when they were afraid, are not just inspiring, they're gut-wrenching and a true testament to faith. I want to share a brief story. On Sunday, I had the honor to take them to Our Lady of Guadalupe here 
um, to go to church. And during the collection, our, our new neighbors started taking out a dollar to put in the collection. And I have been doing this work for 10 years. Doing community organizing is important to me because my faith calls me to go beyond the walls of my church and actually put my faith into action. And in that moment, our new neighbors showed me what it means for them to also be able to contribute to our community and their desire to be incorporated fully into our local community for the future communities where they want to be at. Yeah. And so, um, in these conversations with them, I said, no, you, you know, you need to keep that, you need it more than, than our church does today. But they didn't care, they still put it in the plate. You know, and so when you think about our new neighbors, I want you to picture young people full of energy, young people that walk for seven months to say, I want to have that American dream because my family deserves a better life. I deserve a better life. And that is the same reason why my parents came to this country. And guess what? I have a better life. Come on, Gary. Let's go. And I hope that everybody that is hearing us today has been following this story, keep an open heart no matter where you stand because these folks, trust me, they come here ready to work. They are here to contribute to our community. They are beautiful, beautiful young people full of hope. And how lucky are we in Sacramento that they didn't know where they were going to land, but they were brought to us and guess what? They couldn't have landed in a better place because Sacramentans knew what it means to come together, and we are here to walk with them. We don't know where that journey is going to take us, but we're here to walk with them. And so I just want to thank the community, and I want to thank all of our partners for standing with us today. Thank you, Gabby. I'm going to invite uh, a representative from the National Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Father Juan Francisco, to come and speak to us. Muy buenos días a todos. Me da mucho gusto encontrarnos en este lugar para compartir la experiencia que hemos tenido con los hermanos que han llegado a nuestros santuarios los días pasados. Estaba yo en una reunión cuando me informaron que había unos hermanos que habían llegado a la diócesis. Y lo primero que llegó a mis oídos fue las palabras de la Virgen. No estoy yo aquí, que soy tu padre. Y le dije a la persona que me habló, por favor, tráiganos al santuario. Aquí lo recibimos. Siempre hemos, como santuario de nuestra Madre Santísima de Guadalupe, tratamos de cumplir la misión encomendada. Escuchar a los más necesitados, a los pobres, a los huérfanos y a los migrantes. Sabemos todos los que vivimos en este país, en Estados Unidos, que todos somos migrantes. Por eso es muy importante que nos veamos como hermanos, como amigos, cumpliendo el mandato de nuestro Señor Jesucristo. Ámense los unos a los otros como yo los he amado. Por eso es muy importante continuar el trabajo, que cada uno haga lo que tenga que hacer bien desde el espacio donde se encuentra. Estamos en el santuario, cumplimos nuestra misión, atender, escuchar, apoyar, orientar, otros harán otro trabajo, bendito Dios, y si todos nos unimos en esta barca para que no se hunda, vamos a salir adelante, por eso los invito a que cada uno haga lo que tenga que hacer de acuerdo a su misión y sigamos remando mar adentro, buen día a todos. Thank you, and now I'm inviting Rabbi Mona Alfie, the Rabbi of Congregation Benai Israel. Good morning. In Judaism, we're taught that in each and every generation, we should see ourselves as if the Holy One had redeemed us from Egypt, had redeemed us from slavery and oppression. We're taught this so that when we see the stranger in our midst, when we see the refugee, the immigrant, the asylum seeker, we see ourselves in them. When I was part of the group to welcome them to Sacramento, I have to admit, I did not see myself in their face. I saw my father, 
who came to this country at the age of 17 by himself. I saw my great grandparents, also teenagers, who braved the voyage over the ocean to come to America, all of them with the same hope to have a life where they would be safe and where they could provide for their families. I didn't see myself because I don't see the courage that they have in my own eyes. I've never known what it's like to be so afraid that the better option is to walk for seven months, to walk through jungles, to risk my life for the possibility of a better life on the other side. It would have been hubris for me to see myself in their face because what I saw was so much better than I have ever been called upon to do. When I heard that yesterday some of them had said that it was the first time in a long time that they felt safe, it was the first time in a long time that they didn't feel hunger in their bellies, I wanted to cry. We take these things for granted. We wake up each and every morning safe in our own beds, with our families, with a refrigerator to open up and to decide, hmm, do I want to eat that or that? We don't know what that fear is like. We don't know what it's like, what is needed to motivate someone to risk their own death to come for freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi uh, Mona. The Reverend Raji Rambok is going to speak to us now. He's the pastor of Parkside Community Church. Recently in the Christian liturgical calendar was the day of Pentecost. And on this holy day of Pentecost, back in the beginning, the first one when this nascent group of Jesus followers got together at the time a Jewish holiday was happening, the sky opened up, the wind was whipped, and flames like tongues came down from the heavens and rested on the gathering. And this was a very diverse group of people, different cultures, different backgrounds, different languages, different education levels, on and on and on, different people from all over. And after this natural event, they understood each other. Now, in the retelling, a lot of times, the spectacle is treated as the miracle. The spectacle was not the miracle. The miracle was they understood each other. This diverse group of people whose languages were still foreign, yet they understood each other. So our call in this moment isn't the spectacle of a moment like this morning, although we're grateful for it because it's important to share the news. It isn't the spectacle of grandstanding and big words. It is the movement towards understanding which demands time, attention, proximity, and being open-minded and open-hearted to learn and understand the needs of our new neighbors. As an immigrant myself, it's, it's a thing that lasts with me. It has shaped my existence. These new neighbors have gone through something that will shape their forevers and their families forever. And up to now, I'm still learning a lot about them, but here's what I understand this morning, is that this group of people are some of the strongest people, not just that I've ever met, but that I've ever even heard legend of. I mean, these aren't stories from old that have been embellished over time. These are stories in the here and now of survival, of movement towards hope. And what is first and foremost, just like it was for my father, who immigrated from India with $7 in his pocket, was to earn money to support family. And that is first and foremost on their minds, too. That's what they're asking for. Where can we work so we can give ourselves a shot and, more importantly, help our families back home who don't have the opportunities that I have walked to? So it is our calling as a community of Sacramento to bring forth the miracle of understanding in the here and now in 2023, a new kind of Pentecost 
a pluralist Pentecost where we all gather and we all support, we all learn and move forward in mutual understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. These are my colleagues who have been doing work primarily with the uh, asylum seekers that have come here, and I'm grateful for them for sharing. Now we're going to ask uh, our mayor, Daryl Steinberg, if he'd come and speak to us. Thank you, Dean. On behalf of my city council colleagues, Vice Mayor Eric Guetta, Mayor Pro Tem Mai Ven, and Council Member Katie Valenzuela, let me begin by saying I have never been more proud to be a Sacramento. <laughs> Gabi Trejo spoke about the faith of Sacramento Act, which is the faith of all of the leaders standing behind me. And she described the mantra as faith, justice, hope and inclusion. I'm sorry. Faith, justice, hope and inclusion. That is the value of the city of Sacramento. We gather here today in great in great strength and in great numbers welcoming people who, as my rabbi Mona Alfie described a few minutes ago, have taken the most harrowing journey for the most basic of human impulses, to want to have a better life for themselves and their families. I had the opportunity last night to meet several of our asylum seekers and what struck me was not only their friendly nature after they have gone through such a journey, more than anything else, it was very clear to me that while they were grateful for our community's help and support, they were not asking for anything. The only thing they want is the opportunity to give back, to work hard, and to contribute to this country so that they can help their families. That's the, that's the immigrant story over the course of nearly 300 years in this country. And but for our indigenous brothers and sisters, all of us, all of us come from a generation of immigrants, some more recent than others. The impulse to want to lead a better life and to come to this country that proclaims as its, as its great calling, give us your tired, your poor, and your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, this is just another chapter of that history and our collective journey. What does Sacramento do? What you have done over the last 72 hours, the faith community, the city government, the county government, without flinching, without a moment's hesitation, without a question, what can we do and what must we do to make sure that 36 people know that they are safe and that they are welcome? Bring it on. Bring it on. Our community will never say no. To the people who wonder whether or not we can handle this on top of the real challenges we face in our community? There is no other answer but to say yes. And you better believe we can handle it. 
Sacramento should be a model for the rest of the state and the rest of the nation. This is how we roll. You bring people to our community who don't know where their hope lies, we will provide them hope. You bring people to this community who don't know where their future lies, we will help them find their futures. You bring people to our community in need, and we will, will respond in a way that will send a message to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Thank you to everybody here who has stepped up without hesitation the Sacramento way. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Feinberg. Thank you. I'm going to invite one of our volunteers who's been spending uh, quite a bit of time with the asylum uh, seekers who are with us to come and share an experience. This is Shireen, dear to my heart, a member of the Cathedral Congregation and a volunteer in the SAC Act. Shireen, Shireen Monk. Thank you, Dean Matthews. Um, it's been my pleasure to respond um, as a member of Sacramento Act and as a member of Trinity Cathedral to this need that arrived on our doorstep. And, and it's been a blessing to, to briefly get to know some of these newcomers. I had the opportunity to take a, a couple of groups out to get clothes because they had no clothes other than what, was, what they were wearing, which I presumably they've been wearing for days if not weeks. So we went to a thrift store and um, they had the opportunity to pick out a couple of outfits. One man came up to me and said, can I buy sandals? Yes, if you want sandals, get sandals. And, um, and then later, our congregation um, was able to round up some duffel bags because now that they have stuff, they need a place to put the stuff. But they continually, during this shopping trip, expressed tremendous gratitude to me. And I said, it's not me. I'm only the face of my congregation and an entire community that wants to see you be treated with dignity. And they said, what can we do to pay you back? And I said, pay it forward. And I explained the concept that sometime during their lives, they would have the opportunity to help some other people. I wanted to um, play, hopefully this will work, um, a, uh, some of the words of the, um, of the immigrants briefly. <laughs> so he's saying, I want to say how grateful I am and long live Sacramento. <laughs> um, here is the voice of another. but he came because his family lacked resources and money. Um, he traveled through Colombia, through the jungle, through the desert, um, through all of these countries. He talks about it. Along the way, two of the companions he was traveling with were killed. So, um, so he, he is here. Um, uh, the woman that, uh, that we started to hear, she said, um, she said she feels thankful. I could never have imagined what's happened in the last few days, she said. Um, my traveling has had a lot of difficult moments, but I thank God um, that I'm hoping to have um, a good life here and that I was welcomed with open arms. And she says, um, I want to work and serve because we are here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen. Uh, Shireen is a beloved member of Trinity Episcopal Cathedral here and a volunteer with SAC Act, as many of the people up here on the stage are. And thank you for your work. It reminds me that some people might want to know how they could help financially. Um, 
www.sacact.org yes. and all of their giving, all of the money they receive in fundraising in the next two weeks is going to go entirely um, to this course. Um, and you can go and find a donation button and page there if you would like to help and assist with these ongoing costs. I'm going to invite the Reverend Julie Wakefield, the canon to the ordinary of the Diocese of Northern California, representing the Bishop of Northern California, to come and share with us now. Good morning, buenos dias. Um, I work for the Right Reverend Megan Traquere, the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Northern California. She's out of town this week, and I'm honored to share a few words on her behalf. There's a very basic theme that echoes throughout the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Love God, love your neighbor. This is our first and most important moral imperative. And the Bible is clear. Whoever shows up in need is our neighbor. Loving that neighbor means at the very first level meeting their basic needs. Food shelter, clothing, comfort, and care. These, my friends, are not complicated theological ideas. And though we are gathered here today as religious leaders and people of faith, we know that anyone can join us in this work of offering tangible acts of love and compassion to those in need. We are here today as people of faith and people of prayer, but we are especially here today as people of love in action. We represent groups that are living our faith out loud, not because of politics, but because fellow human beings showed up here in need. Our faith demands that we respond, and we do so by remembering that there is a time in every family story when they were in a strange place and needed the love of a new neighbor. We are here in Trinity Episcopal Cathedral in Sacramento because this is a church that not only proclaims love, but lives it, offering welcome and kindness in practical ways. So to our new neighbors, a nuestro vecinos nuevo, bienvenidos, welcome. We know you didn't plan to end up here, <laughs> but we're honored to show up for you in your time of need. And to those watching, we invite you, please join us in loving and welcoming our new neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Julie. I'm going to invite Pastor Les Simmons from the South Sacramento Christian Center to share with us now. Thank you. Honored to be here. They normally, at this particular part of the press uh, conference in, in church, this would be kind of those moments of uh, the ending of a of a meeting at church would be kind of an altar call. And so uh, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna do an altar call for the work that's in front of us, not for the folks that are lined up right here. We already responded to the call to say yes when 36 uh, asylum seekers and immigrants arrived in Sacramento. Gabby responded uh, right away on Friday when she got the call. And all of our government officials responded uh, right away. Uh, we found ourselves in a huddle space with uh, state work, state officials, uh, our governor, uh, our AG, our mayor, and other clergy leaders, all saying yes to answering the call. I happened to be able to spend some time with the asylum seekers this past Saturday, pretty much a full day with them. And they didn't ask to be here. They were dropped off here with the hope and the promise of jobs and opportunity. They were left to fend for themselves. They were promised the delivery of, of a better opportunity, but they were left to defend for themselves. I say today, they don't have to stand alone. 
We're standing with them to deliver on the hope of good and service. We're standing with them to deliver on the message of love that all of us hold as our value, our faith value. We, we stand to deliver on unity. We stand to deliver on jobs. We stand to deliver on safety. We stand to deliver on justice. We stand to deliver in treating people as human beings. So we all say yes. I just want you to say this with me. Say yes. Yes. I'm answering the call. I want all those that will be watching this press release to say, yes, I'm a Sacramentan, I'm a Californian, I'm answering the call. When people are in need, we show up and we love on them with the love of God. Thank you so much. Uh, we will embrace every single one of them. I almost did an off the call right there. <laughs> we say yes to the call. We say yes to loving our neighbors. We say yes to the 36 individuals and a dog. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Letts. Um, I started with a prayer. Uh, it's a cathedral. We're here uh, because of our faith and because uh, we believe that we want to help our neighbors. So I'm going to end with a prayer and then I'm going to open for questions. Live without fear. Your courage has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you like a mother. Now follow the good road. And may God's blessing be with you always. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask Mayor Steinberg and Gabby if you come and join me, and we're happy to answer questions. Uh, Randy, I think, has a microphone so that your question can be heard on the church live stream. Um, and I am open to anybody who would like to answer a question. Randy, can, let's let Randy in. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all so much, Laura, for being with Politico. Um, do we know anything about what the migrants were told? Do we know the circumstances of how they got on the plane? I, I think a lot of people are wondering how exactly this kind of thing happens. Uh, yeah, so they were in the media. I'm going to also ask uh, Cecilia for some oh, team to just try not to do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Cecilia hasn't slept very much. No, uh, she's been with them longer, amazing. so I will have Cecilia answer. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Um, I wanted to know if Myron said anything about what they thought was happening, why they got on the plane, or what they were told at the location. I think people are wondering how this kind of thing actually happens. Sure, um, as many of you have read probably in other sources or have investigated yourselves, you've probably seen they were approached um, outside of a migrant center um, in El Paso where they were told that um, people representing themselves as part of some type of contracting or organization that could help them relocate um, where to a place where they would be provided with shelter, housing, um, and job opportunities. And you said it's young people. Do you have an age range? Um, I'd say 20s and 30s. And what's the name of the dog? <laughs> Maybe you have a dog. Is there a dog? Geico, like the insurance. It's not sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Jody Hernandez with NBC Bay Area. I'm curious if, uh, if this new group of um, migrants also had documentation from Florida. I know the first group um, the Attorney General mentioned did. Do we know that? We don't know. We don't know that. And where are they being housed right now? Are they in homes? Are they? Yeah, we're um, not publicly revealing their location, obviously, to protect their privacy. But uh, be assured that they are safe, uh, they are being well cared for, and they're in good spirits. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, where are they housed? Carmen Dickerson with Fox 40. Um, well, I understand that the migrants did not know where they were going to come, but did they understand that they were coming on a plane to California? Did they think they were going 20 minutes away? Did they know that they were going to be going 1,000 miles away? They, they had no idea they were, what the location they were going. They had no idea they were in California or how long the trip was going to take. And can you tell us what you know about the logistics of once they actually landed on the tarmac in Sacramento? 
Were they just standing there not knowing what to do next? Did they approach someone? How did the support infrastructure come to bring them somewhere? Um, I can't speak to the second group of arrivals, uh, which was yesterday, um, but with the first group, they were transported um, by some type of bus from the airport where they landed to the diocesan offices of Sacramento, located on Broadway, at which point they were told to get off the bus that someone would be coming to receive them. Um, they rang the doorbell of the building, um, boarded the bus again, the driver, the person who rang the doorbell, told them they would be right back. Um, at that point, they left, um, and never came back. Um, so the authorities at that location of the offices um, contacted our organization to come and help, at which point we um, started to get involved. So to be clear, was that bus driver also part of the contracted services or was that a service of the airport? Um, it, it was not a service of the airport. I believe um, that was under investigation, so I can't speak exactly who, that, um, who those operators were, but I know that it was not from the airport that that service was provided. And then just the second ones when they came on the tarmac? Um, I was not present, so I can't speak to the second situation. My name is Linda, I'm with the PCRE Um We heard this thing has also happened in the last year um, for minors um, who were sent to Sacramento. So in Sacramento, expecting you know, migrants to arrive up here, and how many Sacramento are ready to receive them? Um, I think I got off my mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say that we are preparing, right? Um, we just, the only thing we can do is prepare. So we have more folks and, um, you know, we're taking it day by day because we have 36 people now. And so we will respond as a community, whether it's church days or we. We will never cower. Ever. We'll welcome people. We always have. We always will. Hi, you can answer the other times. Um, quick question for the mayor. Uh, are you, is the city itself, planning to take any action in response to this? And what sort of action do you think the state should, should do to A, help these people and B, to, I guess, react to what we think was an well, the, the Attorney General is the, it, it has all the legal authority uh, to investigate and to bring any charges as necessary. But, you know, I want to go back to uh, the original purpose of this press event. Um, I, I don't want to talk about who may have done this, who likely did this. Um, they, he, are not worth dignifying. Yeah. This is this is worth uplifting what you see behind me here today, because this is the best of American values. Right. Just we know and we don't want details about locations or individuals, but we're just trying on a I guess a human basis to understand are they grouped together? Are they living with individual families? Are there any special requests they've had for food or a phone call home or whatever they, you know, just some humanness, I guess, to broadly tell us what their lives are like right now. Yeah, um, they all have phones now, so yeah, you know, we were able to get them um, to communicate with their loved ones and among each other. Oh. And then, um, yeah, so they're staying as groups. So there's group one and group two, um, and they're together. So they have bonded. They didn't know each other before coming to Sacramento. They kind of met on the right. So uh, they're a community and together. Yeah, I mean, I will say that um, everyone I talk to, um, as I said earlier, they, they want to work. They want to help. I mean, it's, they didn't quite say it this way, but they could have, you know, instead of asking what can you, all of us, do for them, yeah. Yeah. they wanted to know really what they could do. That's the spirit. That's the spirit of these asylum seekers. Um, they want a better life. There's nothing but good in that. 
and, and, that, and, and that reminds me of a story that one of the gentlemen shared yesterday, because I just want to remind folks, they are, they can be in this country. They have this paperwork. They're legally yeah. in our country, yeah. right? So there's a big distinction. And one of the gentlemen told me yesterday, so he said, you know, like I was working in El Paso and I, you know, I'm in Texas and, you know, I just want to work. And so he said, I'm glad I didn't stay there. I'm glad I got to meet you all and got to be here. So just want to remind folks that like, that is why their, um, our, our new community is asking about work because they were working over there. They're open, free to roam around, right? Um, so they're just free agents. Um, just to answer that, I think something that we've been trying to do as far as their living arrangements, their clothing, their, their needs, um, I think in the process when they were coming, you know, they were depending on the generosity of others, meaning whatever they could get, they would take, right? So um, part of our approach is allowing them to define for themselves, you know, what type of clothing do they like? For example, that's why we took them to the thrift store. It's not that we don't want donations, but there's something about letting people choose. And actually one of them made the comment in the thrift store, it's been years since I've been able to pick my own clothes. And it's not that I'm not grateful, but I finally got to wear outfits that feel like me, right? So with regards to their sleeping arrangements, naturally, for example, yesterday, it's like, okay, men and women. Well, no, some of them came in groups of three with like a girl and two boys or whatever it was, and they feel safe together. So we're allowing them to define for us what their needs are and how we can best meet them. And that's something they have not encountered. Um, I think until they got here, you know, I asked them, for example, what do you guys like to eat? And they're like, no, we're okay with pizza and sandwiches. I said, well, I didn't ask if you were okay with pizza and sandwiches. I asked, what do you like to eat? And they almost had trouble answering the question. So I said, okay, let me rephrase that for you. Um, if we go to dinner tonight, where should we go? Oh, and then we got all kinds of ideas, right? So that's our approach, is really enabling them to feel, once again, empowered in the agency over their own lives. Ma'am, can we get your name? Hi, Cecilia Flores, I'm from Sacramento. And could C E C I L I A F L O R E S. Hi, uh, Tom Wendell, uh, Associate Press. Can you talk about how recent um, is asylum seekers arrived in the U.S.? Do you know when they arrived in the United States? When the asylum seekers arrived in the United States? They all actually have varying dates of arrival into the country. And can you talk about how, um, where were they going during F2, when they got to Texas, and are they going to be staying Sacramento now um, with the help of um, the coalition? A lot of them have different destinations. Some of them um, were hoping to be reunited with friends or family throughout the country. There are a good number of them that their destination was the United States. And so now they are trying to determine what the best place for them will go, whether that's where their next um, appointment is with immigration or if um, they might want to stay local. So that is still um, an ongoing discussion with them and to be determined at this time. Hi, Tori Abadaka with CBS News in Sacramento. Um, I understand a lot of them have uh, pending court cases in cities across the country. Are they meeting right now with immigration lawyers to be able to make cases? I, I want to, uh, yes, um, a number of them are. The Fuel Network, which is the city-funded effort launched by my colleague Vice Mayor Guetta, um, has organized legal assistance, but we are also, we've also put out the word far and wide to immigration lawyers. Um, uh, UC Davis has a very, uh, UC Davis King Hall has a very robust immigration clinic. Uh, We've reached out to others, and so part of the call here today is yes, we need we need attorneys uh, who can who ensure that all of the people, all thirty six, have uh, legal representation. Hi, I'm Marisa Kendall here with Cal Matters. Can you tell us a little bit more about exactly what services have been provided for these people, and whether it's all from donations or whether any uh, city or county resources have been used as well? Sure, we are collaborating with the city and county and different nonprofit agencies and partner groups and churches throughout the area. I know, for example, to, um, we've had a nurse on site um, that the county um, had sent. We have the fuel network attorneys coming, I believe, today or another day this week for the public. 
<laughs> helping as well. Um, uh, we're working on counseling service, mental health evaluations, a dentist, um, haircuts, things we don't really think about. That was like a, a need for some of them. They just haven't had a haircut. So we're trying to provide, again, we're letting them kind of dictate what they believe their needs are. And as those arrive, we're, we're going to try as best as we can within all of the collaborators, collaborators that we have to meet those needs as they arise. What are we um, just, just want to say there was a question there about uh, resources and SACAC.org is mm -hmm. collecting funds and the funds mm -hmm. that are collected through their general fundraising page are all going to go to this purpose for at least the next two weeks and I think that will be reassessed at the time. Gabby, you may want to say more or no? no? Oh, I love you. Okay. So, so far it's been just donations. Well, a significant <coughs> amount of in-kind if you will, help of city personnel, county personnel, where we're all engaged. I mean, this is a team effort. It's community driven, but we're saying yes to any request for support. And of course, one of the issues that will arise over the days ahead is housing. And that's another uh, uh, issue where we're prepared, even with our challenges, to make sure that everyone has decent housing. Um, hello, sir. So, um the uh, 36 migrants, are they still all under your care, your hospitality, or, or has any of them decided to depart from the group? And can you also tell us whether any of them have already been able to find a job to even work in another way? Yeah, um, I believe that there is a handful of folks that were uh, reunited with um, family or um, friends. So I think it was a Four, four folks were um, picked up on the first day of arrival. So they were, um, the, sorry. <laughs> on Friday, um, two individuals were picked up. Um, they had relatives in the Bay Area. So these are folks that have, like I said, the majority of them don't have uh, loved ones in the area or in other parts of the country. Jobs? Any, no, nothing on the jobs yet. So, anybody have any? <laughs> 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 yeah. They'll do anything. They, they told Padre, uh, on, on Friday when they first got to there, my father, you know, we, we know how to paint, we know how to, like, you know, we'll clean toilets, we'll do whatever we need to do. So they are definitely very like, open. So and so just start to clarify, so all of them are able to work legally in the U.S. So if someone's looking to hire and wants to get in connection, they could get in touch with SAC Act and make that connection? I was looking for Marcus uh, from the Field Network, and I don't see him here. I am not an attorney, so I was sharing a story about how they survived the Texas experience without any resources available to them. So, but they're <coughs> legally in this country. I know that. They have their pending courts. Carolina Estrada with Comisión 19. We know this is not the first time some migrants arrived back in September. Are you guys still in contact with that group of migrants and did they get the help that they needed? How are their cases different and why are they being handled differently if so? Thank you. I'm just curious, uh, how does the, the, the level of care and resources compare to what they're getting here than what they were getting in Texas? Maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Does that mean you <laughs> I was not in Texas, so I'm not sure exactly what they received. Um, I can speak to how they have explained to me the experiences differ. Um, in Texas, because there were a lot of people um, in the shelter where they were standing outside when they were approached, a few, um, most of our, the group that is here are young men and women, mostly single. There are a couple of married couples. But because of that, what they told me was that in the shelters, they're primarily um, you know, for women and children, and that they themselves felt like they didn't want to take a kid's spot or a mom's spot in the shelter. So many of them um, in Texas were actually sleeping outside. Um, so here, they're, they're not sleeping outside, they're sleeping indoors, in beds, which is already um, a big difference in treatment, and they're being cared for very directly and intentionally, whereas in Texas, because of the numbers and because of, you know, the bandwidth of the shelters there, um, they weren't receiving that type of indi individualized care. Uh, if you can please identify your, your network and your name when asking the question, that'd be great. We'll take a, a couple more questions before we wrap up here. Uh, Sophia Bolak from the San Francisco, oh, sorry. 
Randy, in the, in the middle. We'll get you the microphone okay. so we can hear you. Yeah. So the Ebola I can stand for the Ebola Chronicle. Um, I'm wondering, do you guys know the specific shelter in El Paso where they were picked up? And were they approached all at the same shelter or were they at different shelters in El Paso? I'm unsure of the exact shelter. What I can say is that they were not like approached in a cohesive group. Like it wasn't like they were all standing outside together and they all got wrangled up. It sounds like it was a trickling type of situation where one was recruited here, a couple more, a couple more, which is why um, Gabby and Shirley don't all know each other actually. Some of them have just met at the beginning of this journey. And, and one thing to add is that it's very important to them to know, uh, for them when they first arrived, um, they wanted to make sure that we knew it wasn't the shelter. They were like, we know it was not the organization providing the help for the other families. So that's very, very important. That's one of the first things they mentioned to us. And are you guys able to say if there are any migrants from uh, countries other than Venezuela and Colombia? I know those are the two countries we've heard so far. Guatemala. Guatemala, okay. Thank you. Uh, Nicole Nixon with Cap Radio News. Um, is there any update on the timelines for these migrants staying here? Are they here until they want to leave to another destination? Do they have in-person court dates that need, they need to be making or can they do those remotely? Um, and when are those? Well, they, Marcus? No, I'm sorry. Okay, they, they do have court dates. I'm gonna say they are free agents. So the moment they want to, that's why their loved ones could come and pick them up. They're free agents, so they can leave whenever. Um, some of them actually were telling us, well, you know, like, we kind of want to stay here. <laughs> right? So like, all right, all right, listen, we got to have to figure out, because they do have court, you know, dates in other, in other locations as soon as next week, um, that they're, we're prioritizing them to speak to um, some of the field network attorneys today, so that whatever needs to happen for their procedure, then, then we move that forward. <laughs> It's our last question. <clears throat> Chip, uh, CBS 13, Sacramento. Uh, can you and do you expect more to arrive? <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing would uh, surprise us, certainly. Um, and we will be prepared and ready to welcome welcome people who need our help. Very simple. You know, it's, um, like I said, if, if this is, I know we're not getting into the politics of this, but if, if this is an attempt to send a message, I suppose I could say message received. Um, but the way we're receiving the message may be different than the way whoever did this intends. But Mary, we're going to welcome people. I'm so sorry. So if you can elaborate, I know you say it's, it's simple. I understand the sentiment of, of love and support is simple, but realistically, the logistics of this. We know that even as a city on a daily basis, the city council, the county grapples with being able to provide services to people who need them. Affordable housing you know, for, for people who aren't yet unsheltered, but who are on the brink, for people who are living on the street. Shelter beds, this is a question every day for your everyday Sacramento no, no residents. If, if there is a plan to continue to intentionally bring people who will need these services realistically, so are you able to absorb that? Maybe I need to distinguish two, two parts of the, the question, or at least what underlies the question. Uh, whoever is doing this is uh, committing a terrible wrong. So that's one given. But the other given is, the, the other question is what must be our response when innocent people come to our city and land on our doorstep. And there is only one answer. We must find a way. We must find a way to continue to house the homeless. We are up to 1,100 beds every night. We are working closely with the county. We are getting more people off the street. And yes, the problem uh, continues to be a serious one. But that's exactly the kind of false choice that they want us to make, to put us in the corner. And, and so sometimes you take the complicated 
questions in life and you simplify them. And there is only one response to this kind of evil, and that is to respond in a loving and a humane way and to do our best to grapple with and balance all of the challenges we have in our community and to say yes, and that's what we'll do. For us to, for folks to know that it is the faith community who is taking the lead, right? And that the faith community has been part of this community, has stepped up every single time that we need it. I know how many resources that they have been the safety net for this region. And so for us, outside of anything, whether it's more people or not, at Sacramento Act, we believe that people closest to the pain have the solutions to their problems. And for that reason, for 33 years, we have been in this community advocating and teaching people about the power of their voice. That's what we do out here. And the faith community has been stepping at the center of every chaotic moment we've had in the region. And if we have more chaotic moments, we will continue to step in the middle of it because I am reminded that um, as a Catholic woman, I think I have this image of when Jesus was in the hill and they didn't have enough food to feed people. But guess what? That's a lie. They figured it out then and we're going to figure it out again. So it is a lie that there's not enough, that we don't have the resources. It's about a choice and we, the faith community, are saying we are making a choice. We said yes to the call and regardless of whether the government stays or they're here with us, we will continue to figure out because people like Shereen have volunteer their time, our cooking meals. And so that is about a choice. This is not about politics. This is about people that didn't make a choice to come to our region. And so if more people are brought here, I want people to know there's a way for you to connect and help because we have to do what Jesus did in that hill. You bring a little piece of bread, right? And um, I, I know that in different faith communities, we are called to respond in different ways, right? I know um, uh, my, my colleague, Kalima, I'm gonna butcher uh, some of, well, some of the, the folks, the, the stuff that she's uh, shared with us, but it's like, either you can pray about it, you can work up, you can do something about it, right? When you see an injustice, you have to take action, whether you, even if it is just a prayer, right? And that is at least the minimum thing that you can do. And so, um, yes, there's a lot of problems in our community, there's a lot of need, and I think this gives us an opportunity to see how it, what is the difference when we start seeing people in need as human beings that requires us to respond to that call. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm going to leave Gabby with the final word and draw our uh, conference to a close. Um, but Calvin is going to have some announcements if you'd like to speak to anybody in particular. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. For any stand-up interviews, we'll be directing all press interviews here in the sanctuary and then out in the garden. Then there's an area out back with any of the members here on the dais, the, the clergy leaders in Sacramento, uh, the mayor will attend for a bit. So if you have any press questions not related to pending legal investigations, that's referred to the Attorney General's office, not regarding Marcos Vineyard, about this situation with these migrants. Please come to us, we'll make sure that you can get standing And thank you all so much for this. Thank you.